think and we can kick it off. Awesome. Welcome friends. This is Deep Learning Adventures, a fun engaging community where we talk about data science and not only deep learning. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to be joined by friends all around the world. Um, it's always fun to meet new people. So I see some new faces today. I want to make sure you feel welcomed. Um, if you want to introduce yourselves on the chat or if you want to unmute yourself, feel free. I want to make sure you feel welcomed. Um, again, you can find us on, on Meetup under Deep Learning Adventures. So let me share my screen so I can point at different resources we have. Uh, we have some upcoming events and all our sessions are recorded and posted on YouTube and I'll share the link with you in a moment. And as you've seen, we've been pretty busy for the last couple of months. We've, we've talked a little bit about basic data science uh, concepts like Python and uh, data visualization and machine learning. We've done a session on introduction to deep, to deep learning. Um, we took a deeper dive into ML with feature engineering. Um, then we took a, a branch out on SQL, data cleaning, geospatial analysis. We did one of the two micro challenges. Uh, we didn't get enough time to dwell on the second one. So Dimitri hopefully will uh, lead the second session on the airline price optimization micro challenge on December 16th. That will be our last session, technical session for the year. And today we are covering machine learning explainability and specifically some really interesting topics like permutation importance, partial plots, and uh, sharp values and advanced views of those values. Oh, no. Think about it like this. When you walk Sorry, if you don't mind muting yourself uh, until we're open for questions, that'd be great. Cool. With that said, uh, welcome everyone. I'll share a few links on the chat, uh, as well as the Slack channel where you can join us. And let me enable share screen. Or actually I'm the one who's presenting the first session. So let me go back to presenting. <laughs> and let me paste the links for you guys. Awesome. So I'll give us a quick overview of the first uh, section and then Dimitri and Robert will cover uh, the remaining sections. So let's take a deeper dive into model insights. So we've seen so far, we've built interesting models. We've built uh, tree-based models. We've built deep learning models. Uh, we've built simple regression models but all of them have something in common, meaning when we try to apply them in a, in a real life situation, so we're trying to do some kind of prediction or classification, um, there's some, a lot of questions around them. For example, what features are important in our decision or uh, if we make a decision, for example, for you know hospital readmission as we're, we're gonna see today, which feature actually is most important to that and how how changing a little bit that value of that feature impacts the overall prediction or the overall uh, uh, performance of our model. So insights or having some kind of uh, explainability in our models is very important. Um, it helps us debug our model. If we see that our model is giving uh, importance to some features that from our real life scenarios don't make much sense, then we know that something is off. Maybe we're overfitting our model or maybe our feature engineering could use a little bit more, more work. Another thing is if we see that, um, as you're gonna see soon that maybe two or three features are interesting or, or have a lot of um, explainability as we're gonna see soon, maybe a combination of those three features uh, as a new feature itself could give us even more predictive power. So maybe combining, uh, features would be a great start, especially if you have a large data set with hundreds, hundreds of features, trying to narrow it down and focus on the ones that really are important is, is, is critical. Um, maybe we have, so we, let's say we identify top three features, whatever those are, and we realize that we don't have a lot of uh, diversity in their values. So maybe that could inform us to what is called here to direct future data collection. The last, uh, the, the, another topic would be 
um, human decision making. So um, let's look at some more examples here. Um, So I think this goes back to um, having maybe somebody like a human in the loop, making sure that these models are um, again on on par with with our real life scenarios, and uh, they're not again overfitting or or maybe predicting based on some edge cases on on our, on our data. And the last point is you know building trust. If if we really build something that we understand how it works, it's not a black box anymore. We can. We can analyze how different features impact our prediction as well as the values of our different inputs, how that impacts our, our predictions. So there's, there's a lot of reasons basically to, um, to get a deeper look, a deeper insight into a model. And there's an example here from a previous Kaggle competition on uh, loan defaults. So given hundreds of features, I think it was about 600 features uh, some of them are anonymized, as you can expect. But there were two specific features here, in this case, F527 uh, and 528, that a combination of them, for example, their difference created a very powerful new feature. So, uh, you know, just looking at these this columns, it's hard to tell that that combination would be useful. But hopefully the, some of the topics I will cover today will lead us in this path. Awesome. So that was just a generic overview of why would we like to take a deeper dive into model insights and uh, some of the interesting questions we can ask. Cool. That said, I'm going to hand it over to Dimitri for our second session. Mm -hmm. and later on to Robert for the last two sessions. Okay, great. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, so um, this section is about permutation importance. And uh, uh, this is a, a technique uh, used to understand how important is a specific feature uh, for the quality of, of, of the model, um, both in predict in classification and regression contexts. Um, so basically, the, the, the idea is that um, uh, uh, you know, the, the influence of the feature, uh, the, the, the quality of the feature is measured by how it affects the final metric or, or the loss of the model. And uh, one of the ways we can do that is just to remove the feature and see what happens to, to the predictions, to the quality of the models. But removing is not really convenient because, you know, you, you need to change the architecture of the model and uh, do some engineering uh, uh, steps so uh, an easier way is to randomly shuffle the feature and see how it affects your uh, uh, your prediction. Importantly, you, you do that at the inference time. So you don't touch the training stage, right? So training is done as it is, um, you know, with uh, straight features without any shuffling. And then when you get the final model uh, fully trained, then you try and mess up single features and see you know, which ones have the worst effect basically on the quality of your prediction based on the final metric that you're trying to predict. Um, it's, it's an interesting technique because it works basically for any model, right? So uh, uh, you don't need to understand the mapping between X and Y to be able to evaluate how important X is. So, even if it's say a neural network, uh, which is a very complex uh, function, um, but then well, once you've built that function, you can permute some of your axes and see you know, if, if the Ys, if the final outcomes are affected or not. So that's, that's the um, general idea. Uh, there are many libraries uh, that implement the uh, permutation feature importance. Uh, they discuss one of them. It's it's a cool library called Eli Five, and so uh, first they basically discuss this uh, this idea uh, on a very simple example. So trying to predict the height of a person at the age twenty, given two features, age ten and socks owned at age ten, um, and so you know they build a model, and then of course if you 
randomly permute this, your uh, prediction quality, however you measure, you know, maybe, you know, uh, mean squared error or R squared as, as a quality of the model. If you permute the predictor, your you know quality of the model goes down. If you permit, permute something that is that has no relation to the um, uh, to the target variable, uh, basically you know your metric doesn't suffer, and and that's the whole idea. Um, yeah, that's that's what they do, uh, and, and basically they show that uh, you know when you shuffle the the, 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 the variable that actually matters, you know, you, you can see that in, in the, uh, in the uh, loss or in the metric. So um, instead of going through the code example on the page, let me stri go straight to the exercise because it uses exactly the same techniques. Uh, yeah, there they are. Um, so they use this uh, data set called taxi fare prediction. The original data set is about uh, 55 million uh, rows, which is uh, each, each observation is, you know, the coordinates of the, uh, you know, the, the, the taxi uh, begin, beginning and, and taxi drop off, the latitude longitudes of, the, of those points, plus number of people in the car. And, uh, you know, the task is to predict the fare. And so that they took a small subset of that uh, for the purpose of this exercise. So uh, yeah, we load the um, we load the data set a little bit truncated uh, just to keep it to keep it small. Mm, that's how it looks. Basically, this is the unique uh, key identifier, and then this is the target uh, date time. Uh, also, would be interesting to see if, if that has any any effect on the uh, on the uh, fare, but it's not part of the exercise. And then pick up longitude, latitude, and drop off uh, long, longitude, latitude, and the passenger count. So that's that's the uh, entire. Um, those are the columns. So we predict the uh, fare amount, and first thing we do is try to uh, try to make sense of. Uh, pick up and drop off points and the passenger count. Uh, so in New York, you know, you pay basically the same fare regardless of the passenger count. So let's see if, 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 if the data shows that. Um, so we fit, uh, we fit, first we split that into uh, uh, training and validation. Um, and yeah, we only take about, you know, 25,000 observations. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, I just build that to, to make sense that uh, the, uh, the fares are distributed log normally, basically. There, there are some uh, uh, receipts, I think $150 or something. Yeah. Mm. Oh yeah, here. So the, uh, biggest fare is 165, and you know someone paid one cent. This is probably you know a technical uh, technical error, um, but generally you know they look as as you know all the prices should look like uh, normal once logged. And then we fit just the basic model, uh, random forest regressor from uh, Scikit-Learn, uh, with just arbitrary number of estimators. I didn't didn't you know, optimize this in any way, just took what, what they suggested. Um, and then, so the first question is, you know, how do we use this permutation importance to assess, you know, which features are important, which are not? Um, oops, yeah, this is, uh, so we create a permutation importance uh, object from this library called Eli5. And Eli5 is, is a, is an interesting library. It has uh, many other uh, many other things. Um, let me. Oh, this is PDP. Yeah. So they have a um, uh, a separate. Uh, this is a separate resource, a separate library. Uh, I think people um, and uh, a very interesting, you know, description and tutorials. Uh, basically. Uh, Entirely devoted to explainability of of different algorithms for uh, from from uh, you know trees to 
Uh, I think they also uh, have uh, neural networks and computer vision. So uh, this is uh, about um, about uh, introspection and, and transparency. And ELI5 is the acronym for explain me like I'm five, right? Mm -hmm. um, so let me go back. So this ELI5 has uh, permutation importance as, as uh, a module. So basically what we do is uh, we call this object. Um, so we call the permutation importance object. With, uh, we mention the model and then we fit uh, the data. But you know the, the model itself was fit of course with the train uh, X and Y and this permutation importance object is fit with the validation X and Y. And this is another, you know, uh, another uh, interesting um, sort of distinction between these uh, feature importances and uh, the ones, for example, provided by the model implementation itself. So for example, when we, when we understand, when we uh, uh, try to see the feature importances in uh, XGBoost or, you know, other tree algorithm, is uh, the, the, the feature importances are based on the train data. So the algorithm tells us, you know, during training, which features it used more often or less often. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll show the, uh, I'll, I'll show an example of that. Uh, and permutation importance uh, is, uh, you know, measuring the importance on the validation on the test data. So um, then, the, the object has the same, you know, dot feature importances as many other um, algorithms. Um, and so basically then we, just let me run this. You know what, I think I, I forgot to run the whole thing. Just let me run all again. Okay. That was quick. Yeah. It stopped after that because we haven't used their libraries. So just, yeah, execute that. Okay. Yeah. They're there. So uh, they have this show weights method that uh, calls the, uh, this perm object and uh, the feature names. And basically it tells us, you know, th th uh, this, uh, the, the weight column is basically the relative importance of, of that feature. Basically what, what it tells us that the passenger count does not affect the uh, fare amount at all. And the uh, longitudes are less important than the latitudes. Um, so these numbers specifically, uh, I looked up the uh, implementation. So these numbers specifically, most probably are the percentage uh, decrease in R squared in this uh, specific case. Um, so for um, you know regression problems, as opposed to you know any specific metric or something. So these are R squared numbers, and basically what it tells us, you know, if we take out the uh, the, the 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 latitude, you know the R square would, will, will decrease by 78%. And if we remove the passenger count, you know, the R square was, would not suffer at all. Um, so uh, I was, I was uh, gonna, you know, contrast that with the traditional feature importance as we see, you know, in, uh, in tree models and, uh, you know, they are implemented in SKLR in itself. So when we feed the uh, tree, tree regressor, it already has the feature importances, but this is this is different, right? So this measures the percentage of times that specific feature is used to re reduce the error. Um, and so, you know, a couple of drawbacks, so measured on the train set as opposed to the metric on the test set, which we actually care about, right? Um, and then, you know, it, it, it because it uh, uh, splits the uh, existing features, uh, the more diverse the features are, the more often it tends to get split as opposed to, you know, uh, features with uh, small cardinality. So th this is, of course, uh, you know, artificial. So you could artificially sort of increase the cardinality of your feature 
um, and the traditional feature importance will increase, um, but the permutation would not be affected. So I just uh, uh, created you know a single data frame that has the uh, traditional feature importance permutation and uh, compared it. Let me uh, let me run this. Yeah, and uh, it's better to be. So that's the uh, that's the difference, right? So, well, passenger count, uh, you know, is not important in either traditional or permutation. But then here it's interesting, right? So, uh, the distinction between the uh, uh, latitude and longitude is much smaller here than than in permutation. So, in a way, permutation is more adequate and uh, more uh, telling about the true uh, sort of influence of the feature uh, to the metric, to the final metric that you care about. Um, and interestingly, you know, there are some inconsistencies between the two, right? So for example, the permutation feature tells us that the pickup longitude is a little more important and the impurity is, is the other way around. So um, I think, you know, th th this true picture is not always reflected during the training time, basically. Um, there are some, you know, smaller questions that don't require any code or something. Basically, they're trying to understand why the latitude is more important than the longitude, uh, and they don't provide any answer. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so some, basically, one of the ideas is that uh, the uh, latitude goes across Manhattan, Brooklyn, etc., and then there are tolls, and, you know, the, the, the distances are larger. Um, so that's, that's one of the uh, explanations. And uh, uh, so basically, uh, when we think about that, you know, neither of the four, neither of the four coordinates are, you know, uh, very telling about the fare, right? So the distance should be telling, but not the coordinates themselves. And so what they uh, add is the uh, you know, the, the change in the longitude and the latitude. And I also added the Manhattan distance, the L1, which is called Manhattan because, you know, it's, uh, it's exactly about the taxi in Manhattan, right? So, um, and, uh, you know, then let's uh, try to see if the uh, distances dominate the other features. And, uh, it's running probably, yes. So when we include the distances, of course, the three distances, you know, the total distance, the uh, horizontal and the uh, vertical dominate everything else. So everything else becomes, let me make this a uh, little bigger. You yeah, can, so every, do you have a panel, Dimitri, open on the right? Yeah, just close that upper right. Uh -huh, yep. There you go. Okay, so um, everything else becomes irrelevant, right? When we include the distances themselves, everything else becomes uh, irrelevant. And uh, without the Manhattan distance, uh, let me... Uh... Without the uh, total distance, you know, the L1, uh, it will be, you know, the horizontal and vertical dominate everything else, basically. Uh, very uh, sort of intuitive way to see, uh, in intuitive thing to see. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is also uh, an interesting question, but uh, yeah, so uh, one thing to, uh, to mention probably is that it tells us, you know, uh, how, how important it is uh, for the uh, quality of the final metric, but doesn't tell us uh, what's the direction of the change, right? So as in three models, for example, it shows us that the, uh, the, distance, uh, the distance is the most important predictor, but you know, what is the exact nature of the relationship between the distance and the fare? You know, it, it doesn't tell us. And uh, that's when we use uh, the partial dependence plots. So that's the uh, second section that I'm going to cover today. 
Uh, so this is uh, the, this technique uses pretty much the same sort of uh, same um, framework uh, in, in the way that you know it, it doesn't touch the training data. So it uses the already trained model and then tries to see, uh, given the trained model, you know what, what how can we quantify the dependence between the x and y's. And so what it does is basically um, if we have say 10 features, uh, 10 predictors that affect the, the outcome, we hold nine of them constant. And then the 10th one, we assume all the values that you know, to, to the 10th that that feature can assume. Um, and uh, basically we calculate, uh, you know, the average, the average Y, the average, uh, uh, the average target uh, across our data for all those, you know, possible values of, of that feature and then take the average. So basically uh, let's say, you know, if we're doing house prediction uh, and we were trying to understand, you know, what's the uh, dependence between, say, the square feet and the price, right? And so we keep all the other variables as they are. Uh, we don't we don't touch them. And then, you know, for all of the data points in our data set, we change the uh, square footage from, say, I don't know, 100 square feet to 100,000 square feet taking, you know, uh, uh, taking, uh, keeping everything else the same and then see, you know, what the prices are produced by the model for those houses, for each of those, um, you know, uh, square footage points and then averaging, uh, you know, the prices for that specific square footage across all the houses. And so it gives us sort of the composite prediction that on average, you know, given the entire data set, uh, the house of, I don't know, the small house would be worth this much and slightly larger house would be worth uh, more, et cetera, et cetera. So it builds sort of the composite uh, curve, the, the composite uh, relationship between the X and Y. Um, so, yeah, so this is important. Again, the partial dependencies after the model has been fit. And uh, just as the uh, permutation, uh, permutation feature importance, you know, that protects us from all kinds of, you know, training, uh, training biases and, you know, the, the maybe, you know, the quality of the uh, model and the quality of the data, et cetera. It, it measures exactly what we need to measure, which is the uh, evaluation of the, the test data. Um, so, and again, let me go exactly straight to the code example. Oops, let me go. Um, so we will use the same uh, data set. Let me run this. And please, please let me know if there are any questions after this point. So that's the that's our data. We describe the data. It's not important. Okay, so uh, here they use another library, uh, and again, uh, PDP is implemented uh, in many libraries. Um, so this one was new for me, PDP Box. So we import this uh, these modules. Uh, we mentioned the um, the feature. We fit, you know, this is the syntax that we use, pdp.pdp-isolate. We mentioned the, uh, yes, that's the feature. That's the feature. And then what it does, it draws this, this point, uh, the, the, this line. So this is the longitude um, range, basically from 74 uh, west to 73.9 west. Uh, this is basically New York City, uh, the entire city. Um, and what it tells us is that, you know, going from here to here, keeping everything else, uh, you know, uh, basically 
averaging across all the other all of the other uh, variables uh, that's the effect that we uh, that's the you know the, 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 the difference that's the effect that we uh, get by uh, moving um, you know from, from this pickup longitude to this pickup longitude so basically if we picked up this is probably uh, I don't know maybe the extreme points of Brooklyn maybe JFK or something if we picked up the taxi here the fare will be you know ten dollars more than you know if we if we uh, if we, the, the taxi picked up you know somewhere in Manhattan so basically that's that's the picture we get that's again on average averaged across all the other uh, observations um, so yeah this is the same thing um, basically they uh, what they do is you know they build the same plots for all other features. Um, and for example, for pickup latitude, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's even, the defect is even bigger. So that's, again, the, the midpoint is, is Manhattan. And this, uh, uh, you know, uh, this thing is probably, uh, this thing is probably southern, it's Staten Island or something. So this is the southernmost most point. So the, uh, again, basically, you know, whatever happens in the middle of the city is on average cheaper than, you know, at the ends, on, at, the, at the outskirts. Um, okay, so now we can do uh, 2D uh, partial dependent plots, you know, combining two variables and understanding, you know, the interdependence um, between them. And uh, they have a few uh, regimes. So one of the regimes is counter plot. And basically what, it, what they build is, you know, uh, drop of longitude and pick up longitude, you know, the basically the, the, the two the two uh, points, you know, the, the from east to west, right? Um, so that's the counterplot of the uh, uh, of, of how they affect the fare. And so basically, what they say is, if we pick up, you know, somewhere in Manhattan and drop off in Manhattan, you know, the uh, fare is uh, smaller. But if we picked up in Manhattan and drop off, uh, I don't know, in uh, JFK, the fare is, is higher. So that's, and that's the same thing in the other direction. So this is interesting. Like if you pick up um, at, uh, you know, Brooklyn and, and drop off at Brooklyn, it's not, not as, the effect is not the same as, as in Manhattan. So it's not as straightforward and obvious. Uh, but you know there must be some reasons for that. Uh, maybe tolls, maybe something else. Uh, yeah, this is this is just a textual uh, question they ask, like you know, if uh, how we interpret this uh, the scale. But I think you know it's it's pretty self-explanatory. So uh, yeah, one thing we do is again we add back the uh, the distance features that we introduced last time, and uh, we'll see how it um, how it affects the uh, partial dependence. Let me yeah. So basically, this is an interesting exercise. Basically. Uh, comparing the partial dependent plots without the distance feature and with the distance feature. So, you know, if we take this feature, pick up longitude, and we uh, fit, you know, with that before introducing the distance, and we try to understand, uh, you know, feature, uh, partial dependence, uh, you know, the range is pretty distant. So, you know, from the westmost to, uh, to the easternmost to westmost, uh, points of the city, the difference is, you know, $10. Um, 
but once we introduce the distance, uh, it's only like the same longitude. It's only you know one dollar or something, and maybe you know just within the 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 margin of error. So the longitude itself becomes pretty much irrelevant once we know the the distance uh, itself. So this is again you know some verbal uh, verbal uh, questions. They're trying to make sure that we understand what's happening. Um, I think that this is uh, this is this was an interesting exercise. Um, let me go go here. Yeah. So if we create like you know two uh, uh, two variables x one and x two, uh, just very uh, sort of you know out of theoretical uh, uh, variables, basically. Uh, this is uh, uh, the rand is from zero to one, four to uh, times rand is from zero to four. And so this whole thing is from minus two to plus two. So, and we have 20,000 examples okay. of, of the same thing. Uh, and the uh, response variable is the pr product of X1 and X2. And so, what this is an interesting example of you know the that the, the partial dependent plot you know the one d partial dependent plot for any of the variables is flat basically because you know it averages across all possible uh, all possible values of all the other uh, uh, variables and so because all of the other variables the other variable basically can get both positive and negative your effect on average is is zero, and so you don't you don't make make much sense from just looking at this uh, graph. But the reason why is that uh, the uh, surface, the curve, uh, looks like this. And uh, basically, you know, if any of the variables is zero, the other is zero, and you know the zero point is the saddle. Uh, but uh, what's important is that you know, of course. You know, each variable is very important, but it's just, you know, because partial dependent plot is averaging across all of the other variables, then you get the zero. So basically, whenever we get the chance to look at the 2D or, you know, multiple dimensions uh, of the partial dependence, you know, it's, it's always, we can always get more information. We can always extract more information from there uh, than just to look at the uh, 1D picture. And I think you know that relates not only to PDP but you know to many other uh, multivariate uh, problems and contexts. Um, so again, I think uh, by the way, I, I just copied here. I just added the uh, the same partial dependence and partial dependent plots from sklearn. So this PDP is not the only library, and there are a couple couple more. Uh, but this is native to sklearn and you know it works with the all of the estimators uh, natively uh, as opposed to to to, the, to that first one so i think that's it so let me know if there are any questions on that awesome thank you dimitri uh, i think we have some questions around mm -hmm. drop off and pick up and all that and the question that i saw i don't know if it was in the in this exercise or the previous one was that at some point, it said that um, drop-off location now matters slightly more than pickup location, and I don't know um, based on what criteria we saw that. Is that just based on feature importance or permutation? Uh, importance or did did it say in the text? In in uh, yeah, um, I just don't know if it was this one or the previous one. Um, this drop of location now matters slightly more than pickup location, and I didn't clearly see that. Uh, they were very uh, maybe. Uh, we're you talking about this, or uh... yeah, maybe if you search for slightly, I think it's here. Let's see. Uh, or I can search on my notebook. Anyway. Um, yeah. 
Um, you know, the I think using the uh, coordinates uh, just themselves as predictors mm -hmm. is not a, a very good idea. This is only illustration purposes, only for illustration purposes. So yeah. basically, yeah, we we need to introduce distance metrics, and uh, I've seen this exercise like uh, in the. Um, in the bike share prediction, etc. So they try to use they try to use all kinds of distance metrics, right? The uh, uh, the L1, L2, and then you know they introduce all kinds of complications, the uh, time of the day and, and the uh, season, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so that that's that's what really affects the uh, fare. So one of the other one of the other um, sort of hypothesis was that traveling, uh, you know, cross town from from say you know west side to east side is typically you know for the same distance takes a little uh, longer because the streets are narrower than the avenues and so uh, you know there are all kinds of uh, effects that uh, i think should be taken into account and uh, there are actually tolls in the tunnels from from manhattan to brooklyn um, so uh, all kinds of effects but I think if, for me the, the least expected was that the you know the the latitude is so much important than the longitude. Mm -hmm. So basically east west is much more important than the uh, north south. No, the other way around, right? Oh the other way around. So, so sorry, yeah. The other way around. Yeah. So, yeah. Actually, right. Robert, yeah. yeah, Robert and I have a map. If you don't mind stop sharing, we can share our screen. Sure, room. yeah. Um, I think that will enforce that view. Uh, all right. Thank you, Dimitri. So this is just a simple map of the same data set for the pickup location. And the color coding here is, um, I just look at the mean fair amount. And for each data point, if uh, that trip's fair amount is less than the average, then I, call, I color coded it green. If it's more than the average, I color coded it red. Mm -hmm. And also I made the radius relative to the fair amount. In this case, I put a time stand here just to make it more visible. But this is based on the pickup location. So you could see here that for this lat long, uh, the pickup was here. I don't know where the drop off was. I have another visualization for drop off. But if I want to zoom in a little bit more, um, Because this is an island and it's a very basically a tall island. So if you go north to south, you probably have more options of going north to south. And it looks like um, that's why the latitude is is important. Uh, so, so you're using color as fair amount and the size of the circle means what? Fair amount as well. Oh, okay. I like I'm surprised, the, I'm surprised Brooklyn is not uh, or Queens is not is not covered. Yeah, so the drop off is uh, revealed to me more information on this. So this is based on the drop off, as you can see here. Mm. You see this uh, east side uh, locations where uh, the amount is slightly bigger. And then again, this is a drop off, but maybe a better visualization would be to connect this with a pickup. So maybe this one started from either the northern part or the southern part instead of going east west. Which which library did you use, uh, George, to, uh, to do this? Uh, Folium. So we covered this in our geospatial analysis. Uh, yeah. It's very easy to use. Um, awesome. OK, Robert, I, did you want to show something too? Uh, sure. Go for it. There's a lot of questions about that long on the chat as well. I, I didn't label this, but uh, essentially the um, the two colors, one is pickup and the other is drop off. Um, pickups are red, drop offs are green. I didn't color code fair or absolute distance traveled, but, but a couple of things that stood out to me that weren't obvious from the original code, although I guess maybe I could have looked at it more carefully and I would have noticed the the bounding box and how it kind of affects. Uh, I, I thought it was curious the asymmetry in the longitude plots, right? How 
trips that started, they were talking about that U shape, but trips that started near the West end didn't get uh, anywhere near as expensive as trips starting near the East end of the box. And I think it's just because of where they drew the, the bounding box at line 74, minus 74 longitude. There's so many trips over here that start near that Western edge. And they're all probably shorter trips just because they're, they're in the downtown region. Another thing that I thought was interesting about this, although it doesn't really affect the, the model here at all, was that you can kind of see the colors start to differentiate themselves um, along, along some of the major streets uh, like Broadway and here. Um, some of the biggest streets have more pickups than drop-offs where the drop-offs tend to be a little bit more evenly dispersed in the neighborhoods. And this kind of makes sense when you think about how taxi uh, rides might be hailed from major streets, but once you're in the car, you might as well ask the driver to actually go to your destination. So I thought this was just uh, helpful in understanding that data set. Um, what I did, the, the Folium library can be a little bit slow with this large data set. So I, I think I noticed that George selected the first thousand points yep. uh, to plot. Um, I wasn't sure if that would be a random sample. So you can actually um, get a uh, call the sample method on the data frame um, and it will randomly select 10% uh, um, which you know if for some reason your rows are not uh, have been sorted for some reason then you might get a more representative sample by doing this but uh, I thought I thought either of these visualizations was uh, helpful for sure in understanding that data awesome I was thinking if we wanted to include uh, pickup time and drop off time, we'd have to uh, pre-process that those fields, right? And maybe encode them by day of the time or hour of the day. I don't even remember noticing those fields. I guess they were strings, was it? Um, so they were in the very beginning, but when uh, Dimitri was covering it, if you notice, if you look at base features. Yeah, yeah there, is, there is time, yeah, yeah. It's a subset of the original features. So there's a pickup date time. I don't know if there's a drop off date time. I don't think so, but. Hmm. Yeah, we could extract uh, the time of the day and uh, the weekday, right? Yeah, because it looks like it's multiple days. Yeah. Weekday versus weekend. Awesome. Cool. Cool. Thank you, Dimitri. That was. Very interesting. Um, any questions anyone let us know? There's some questions on the chat. Hopefully we answer them. Otherwise, feel free to unmute yourself. Um, what's on the y-axis of the PDP? Um, are you talking about the, the two-dimensional one, Catherine? Yeah, that's uh, that's the uh, dollars basically on the on the on the y-axis. Uh, that's the difference from some reference point, which is usually the, you know, one of the extremes of your uh, range of the variable. Mm -hmm. So basically, you now for from the very western point, the fair difference is zero, and then how it changes if we move that point, you know, uh, across the range. So it was a fair amount of dollars. Yep. Yeah, the fair amount of dollars. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Dimitri. Alexandra, you mentioned that you've used another library for doing uh, this kind of partial dependency plots like H2O. Uh, yeah, yeah. I personally found the H2O plots maybe less intuitive and maybe that was presentation. Um, yeah. But yeah, I really like how this library displays the information. Awesome. Yeah, I didn't know, Dimitri, that you can actually use this Eli5 for other non-tree-based models. So that's interesting. And as well as partial PDP. Hopefully you can use it for other non-tree-based models too. Yeah, I missed, they, I missed yeah. it. Can somebody restate what the Eli5 library does? I had to come in late. Uh, the, it's uh, basically, you know, explainability library. Mm -hmm. uh, so feature importances uh, and uh, some 
some they have a sort of a more complex library that I didn't uh, have time to go through uh, related to computer vision. Uh, mm. But I think the, the basic idea was the basic basic idea is you know which which points uh, make your model basically uh, you know trigger. So it's it's used in the computer vision, right? So mm. uh, determining the parts of the picture that actually trigger you know the cat or dog classification. Oh, I see. I see. I have another question. So there's a lot. Of I've seen a number of different libraries for doing similar things. Um, is there any view or discussion within Kaggle about which libraries might be better, like in general or for certain tasks, or is that pretty open-ended? I haven't seen anything. Um, yeah, I don't know. I've, I've, I've heard it Eli 5. Um, there's some other ones for computer vision specifically. I forgot their names, but mm -hmm. this one and the PDP one are looks like pretty generic as well. Curious, Robert, David, Dimitri. Yeah, I mean, if you're talking about talking, are you talking about just feature importance, or are you talking about explainability in general? Mm, explainability in general. Yeah, I think that's almost a philosophical debate. There's Shaft and <laughs> Lime and uh, a lot of different approaches. Um, there's, e there's even a bigger philo philosophical question around uh, uh, causality, right? So that's even a bigger, a bigger topic around not what, you know, is it important, but is it actual causal? So that's an even broader subject. But yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's a consensus Okay. There, by the way, there is a talk on Saturday at 10 on the topic of causal machine learning, if anyone's interested. Yeah, I saw that. I'll post it on our Slack. Thanks, Alexandra. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which group? Uh, the Bethesda AI meetup. Oh, great. Yeah. And Nels, I think, asked about if we could use the CLI 5 and PDB for outside of a scale learn. And Robert, I think you mentioned that you. You might be able to. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, you, you can do that. Eli5 has a wrapper for sklearn that you can basically wrap around uh, any sklearn model. At okay. least they claim to, but it's not only for sklearn. Got it. Okay, sorry, it was David. No, you're over. <laughs> cool. Um, awesome. Thank you again, Dimitri. That was great coverage. All right, Robert, the floor is yours. Take us to the next level. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but we'll start looking <laughs> at SHAP anyway. And please don't lose us because this was a very challenging topic for me. <laughs> well, I mean, I'll, I'll say it's uh, somewhat new to me as well. I had seen the ideas before, but had never attempted to implement it. Um, and it is challenging. And, and there may be, there's probably people uh, people with us this evening that uh, that have a better handle on it than than you or I so I, I hope that people will uh, will join us when we when we run into the challenges but uh, might as well awesome. might as well jump ahead uh, so SHAP values an acronym from Shapley additive explanations and so you might ask uh, uh, who Shapley is and so let's see Lloyd Shapley uh, mathematician, can you can you all see my uh, screen here on Wikipedia? Correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I'm sharing all these windows. All right. Um, notable for some work in game theory that was done back in the 50s, and uh, I'll get I'll get into that a, a bit later. But uh, notable for a number of other ec economics contributions as well. So what we've seen so far is permutation importance and the partial dependence plots. And they're very useful for their own purposes, but in both of those metrics, what you are doing is you are aggregating some result over all samples in your data set. And it might be more useful in certain cases to be able to give personalized explainability results to the individuals represented 
represented at certain samples within your data set. So they offer a couple examples here, so, some great examples. Uh, model says a bank should not loan someone money. Bank is legally required to explain the basis for the loan rejection. So if you're a bank running loan uh, classification models to determine whether customers are likely to repay the loan, you generally have to have models that are explainable enough that you can justify uh, rejections. And another great example they provide here is a healthcare provider wants to identify what factors are driving a patient's risk of disease. So you might have a machine learning model that says this patient has a 90% chance of developing heart disease in the next three years, but wouldn't it be much more useful for the patient and doctor to know why the model is predicting that? Are we saying that because of the patient's genetic history or some factors that are totally outside of their control? Or is this something that could be ameliorated by just stopping smoking or changing diet, exercising more? Uh, if those types of features are all built into the model, they can definitely guide uh, clinical decisions. So with that motivation, let's uh, start to talk about the methodology that we'll go over here. Uh, in this case, they have gone back to the soccer question. And we're going to go through that, the uh, soccer question in, in every one of our tutorials. And the question is, if we know that a team scored three goals, how, do, how much do we know about how much that prediction was driven by, for, for that particular team, the fact that they scored three goals. So for Robert, the data set. Robert, I don't think we covered this data set. Can you give us an overview of what this data set looks like, looks like and what are we trying oh, to do? Oh, did we not cover this data set? I, no, we just went to exercise it directly. Okay. Um, so, so. I have a notebook on it if you want me to cover it. What was that? I have a notebook if you want me to cover it real quick. Uh, sure. I mean, just a couple minutes if you want. Okay. Um, yeah, that will give us a better idea of. Was it the exercise? No. No, no, it's in the tutorials only. It's probably described in the permutation importance tutorial. If not, I can just say a few words about it. I don't think the content is of that data set is terribly exciting. I made it exciting, that's why. <laughs> uh, well then. Is it this one? All right, look at that. Um, so this was the FIFA World Cup 2018 data set. And let's just look at the structure of the data real quick. Uh, So we have a team, an opponent, a date. Uh, how many scores did the team on the left uh, score? What was the ball, percent, uh, ball per possession percentage? Uh, how many attempts or shots they tried to? How many were on target? How many were off target? Corner, offside, free kicks, uh, accuracy, how many passes they did? The, the entire team, uh, how many kilometers they covered? If they committed any, uh, any technical errors or fouls, if they got a yellow or a red card, and this is the main feature that we're interested in, man of the match. So if somebody, if a good player from that team was nominated as man of the match for, for that game or not, um, and some other features. And, and does every game have a, have a single man of the match? So it's just one team or the other? Um, I, I think so. 
Um, so typically you'd expect the team that won the game if there was a winner. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's only one per game. Yeah. So these were the games for the World Cup, all the way from round 16, all the way to the final. Um, most of them took place in June 2018. And I just wanted to see how they're sorted based on a country. So looks like France received seven games for men of the match. Well, they, they ended up winning the, the cup as well. Belgium, Croatia, Uruguay, England, Brazil, and so forth. Um, and some basic models that uses different features based on attempts, maybe on free kicks or ball possession. Um, find that interesting. Eli five. Yep. I can tell I'm a messy fan here. So that's the structure of the data set. I just wanted to give you an overview of what it looks like and the man of the matches we're trying to predict. Thank you, Robert. All right, are we back to my screen now? Yes. Excellent. So we're trying to predict men of the match here and we have those features. And what we're doing is we are essentially looking at each feature's contribution relative to a baseline. And I'm just gonna show the figure here at first and they, they show it uh, very small, but they do offer a blown up version here. So what we are seeing here is the features that tended to increase the prediction and increased prediction here is increased likelihood of your team containing the man of the match is goal scored, having, having goal scored equals two on target, fouls committed, corners, ball possession, all these different, uh, different features. That's interesting. I thought when I saw it here, it was uh, inequalities, but it looks like it's all equality. So regardless, it's taking some interior value and it is determining that there are some features that tend to increase the value, some features that tend to decrease the value. Uh, we haven't really learned much about the mechanism behind what's uh, creating these numbers yet, but we have some visualization here that gives some indication of what, what features this particular method tends to favor. So let's uh, move along. And how do you interpret this base value? We'll go into that in a bit. Um, but the biggest impact here was these, these large ones in the middle. When I, when I saw this figure, it reminded me a little bit of the, uh, the these, uh, was it the? Future importance? No, the, the uh, political maps showing oh. like who was going to get to 270, but not the map versions, the ones where you saw the bars trying the to results, trying to reach. Yeah. Uh, okay, so this blog post here was actually really good. Um, Cody, let's see. Yeah. Cody Marie Wild, uh, a couple years ago, wrote this uh, about the paper, the Shapley paper. Shapley Values paper when it was first uh, published at NeurIPS. And this is Shapley Values, but the mathematician Lloyd Shapley himself had nothing to do with this latest research based on his game theory methods. So in the field of game theory, you sometimes have a question if you have a number of collaborating agents you would like to have some idea of who is contributing the most to uh, the success of a team or uh, well, I guess a, a team is probably the, the best way to put it. 
um, so, so that is actually the basis of the, the Shapley uh, game theory. So the Shapley value here was a concept in game theory where they're basically trying to figure out the value of each player on a team, coalition of players. And you come up with uh, an expression down here, uh, which is based on combinatorics in an interesting but very intuitive way. Um, so to motivate a question like this, you might imagine a great example for this might be uh, a, a team sports where you're trying to figure out which player on a particular team uh, made the greatest contributions to your team's success over the course of a season. Uh, there have actually been a lot of metrics that have been in use for the, the major professional sports. Baseball uh, certainly started a lot of the metrics. Uh, football, basketball, a lot of these other major sports have gotten into the act as well. Um, you can see something even, even now in, in the box scores. This is the last game of the most recent World Series here. And you'll see that you have players shown here and these traditional statistics at bats, runs, hits, runs, batted in, shown over here. But now you get all of these fascinating other statistics that never used to appear uh, in, the, in the newspapers 50 years ago. <laughs> so, and one of them is win probability added. There are other statistics called win shares, which you're kind of trying to allocate at the end of a season, how many wins each player on your squad was responsible for. Now, these are not precisely calculated with the Shapley method, but the concept is very similar, where you're trying to allocate a, a certain amount of credit to each member of your team. So how are the Shapley values working then? Um, this post actually does a pretty good job of describing it and it's mostly text. So I thought it would be maybe a little bit more helpful to, um, to have me kind of describe, Im imagine that you have three players on your team and we're now just looking at a picture of a cube that has nothing to do with a team. <laughs> but what, what the concept behind the Shapley value is that all three players on your team reached a certain level of success that we'll represent by this point over here. Okay. And with, uh, without any of these three players, you might expect that you could be replaced them with just three random players. Uh, certainly in the major league baseball example, the teams have come up with concepts such as player replacement player value such as how well can you expect a random person that you could add to your squad when somebody gets hurt? How well could they do? And this is an important concept because you're, you're dealing with the very top end of the bell curve with respect to baseball skills, right? The major league teams might among them have only seven, 800 people on them. And if somebody goes down or somebody needs to replace a shortstop or something, there's a certain level of performance that you should be able to just fill in cheaply from either a minor league player or someone else that's, that's uh, been toiling in one of the other leagues that's kind of hoping to make it to the uh, major leagues. And so you might imagine that that's what's represented down here in this corner. And then as you add your three regular players back onto the team. So you add player A, that might be moving along this axis. And now you have a certain value that you might represent here. And then you add player B up here and you add player C and you get here. And the, the Shapley formalism has a few desirable properties that make it applicable to a question like this. One is it shouldn't matter in which order you add the players. So if you add player C first, that was, let's see, this direction here. So I guess I should trace out this way. Uh, then A and then B, you, you come back to the same point. 
So you can think of this being uh, like a conservative function in the sense of the word conservative that is used in calculus textbooks. <laughs> uh, that, that the, as you go from one point to another, it's only really a function of where you are, not of the path that you took to get there. Robert, I just have to say, I think this past year damaged you. <laughs> uh, in what way? <laughs> Conservative, red, blue. <laughs> Am I using too many loaded words here? <laughs> I just need to get another glass of wine. I don't know. <laughs> uh, what color is the wine? <laughs> red, red. <laughs> what do you know? But that's not loaded. <laughs> Someone might be though. <laughs> no. No, I was just kidding. Uh, but I like the analogy of the cube because it, it clearly explains that the order does not matter. Uh, right. Of your players. So that's an interesting analogy. Yeah, it is. Yeah, so I, I was trying to think of a way to visualize this big, long description in here. And it was the best that I could come up with, uh, you know, today. So, <laughs> oh, thank you. But but they do go into it in far more detail here. They're saying that if you have three players A, B, and C, it shouldn't matter in which order you add them. And so every one of these six ways that you can go from here to there should overall give you the same value. So then the question is, if we got to different value here, we have different values there, certainly knowing just the difference between this point with none of the players and this point with all three players, that doesn't really tell you much. Mm -hmm. So what you need to know is how much did player C, uh, which is this one here, add versus that of player A. And what the Shapley method does is it says, it's saying, look at all six paths and average amongst the six of them, take the mean of the value added when adding that player. So one thing you can realize here is that there may be six different paths, mm -hmm. but there's not six different uh, questions that you need to solve because from this point here you're adding player A and it doesn't matter whether they go here uh, B first and then C or C first and then B it's the same thing you really just need to know the difference in from this point to that point the difference from this point to that point the difference from that point to that point and from that point to that point so you're kind of looking at these four parallel lines to represent a player A uh, this four para these four parallel lines to represent player C and the other four to represent player B. So let's see. So she goes into the, the math behind this and it uh, essentially becomes a combinatorics question trying to figure out how many paths use a particular edge. And you end up with an equation that looks like this, which is to say that if we want to find the contribution of player i, we will sum over all subsets from the space full coalition. This is all the players on the team. Sum over the subset of all of the ones that do not include player i. And then we're going to have some multiplication factor here, which is an indication of how many combinations need to be considering this particular di value difference. And the value difference is represented what's here on the right, which is essentially the, the uh, value of your, the, the total value of your coalition, including that player minus the value of that same coalition, not including that player. Adding it for all different subsets that you could have considered of the other players. So with 
uh, say, M players on your team, then you have two to the M minus one different possible computations you have to do here. So it grows very quickly and can become computationally unreasonable to do for large numbers of players. And so soon we're gonna find out why we're using the, the letter F for players, but it turns out that's actually features. <laughs> Since we're not talking about teams and players, we're trying to do, uh, isn't this post about feature attribution? Yes. So the idea is that the same method can be applied to features in a machine learning model that you applied to players playing such a game. So one player could have a negative contribution or there, there's may, maybe that one player uh, you know, struck out five times in the game or something and really did nothing to help your team win that day. You can have a negative contribution just like some features can individually have contributions that go against what the feature vector does as a whole. So she goes on a little bit further and talks about the case that, so one trivial example, you might think about this cube again, is what if our function is a linear regression? Then because it's a linear regression, you're actually going to get the same value added on this line as you got on this line, as you got on this line, as you got on that line. So it's trivial to decompose your player values uh, by, by, individual, by individual contributor. However, if you have a nonlinear model, then you could find that your model, if these are features, now you could find that your feature, that your outcome predicted is increasing along this edge, but maybe it's decreasing along this edge. And maybe it's increasing along that edge, decreasing along that edge. So we can get some very different contributions that might provide different results where if you use different permutations, you get positive and negative contributions. And you want to account for all of those proportionately. So she goes into, a, I won't go into it in too much detail, but just shows how a simple ReLU function with a single point where you deviate from nonlinearity can bring about such a case where the features do behave in this fashion where you can get decreases on one side and increases on another side. Then she goes in and derives the equation. Really, it's the exact same thing we saw earlier, except that we're calling them features now instead. So one thing that's a little bit more challenging when you make the analogy to features versus players on a team is that you have to consider what does it, what does it mean that a certain feature is absent? because we talk about features being present or absent, we were really talking about adding features into your model as you move from one corner of this cube to another. So th this is a challenging one. And the, the, uh, what the model does essentially is it's trying to form a prediction for this corner whatever prediction that it would make without knowing anything specific about the sample that you're giving it. So in this case, what it's going to do is it's going to output not the, so I was a little bit confused about this. I'm still, still a little bit confused about the exact details here, but I believe what it's outputting at this corner is the mean of the predictions that you would get for all of the samples in your training set. So that's not the same as the mean of the outcome variables in your training set. It, it's the mean of the predictions that you would get 
for all of the samples in your training set. And then as you move down here, so now you're adding, so we'll talk about feature A, feature B as we move up and feature C. Mm -hmm. uh, just a simple question. I'm, I'm assuming that, uh, that you all can see my mouse as I'm scrolling yep. around. Yep. Okay, okay great. Class. Yeah. Otherwise I imagine that would have been kind of confusing much of what I was. Mm. Good. <laughs> cool. So as we go from, from the baseline case here and we add feature A, what we're doing is now we know feature A. So we're gonna rerun those predictions on all the samples in, in your data. But instead now we're going to substitute feature A for every one of the training samples while leaving the other, the other, uh, the, the other samples still with this random distribution. And if we do that here, we get the difference between baseline and empty set plus feature A. We get four different results here, whereas this one up here will be the difference between all three features and feature B plus C only. When you say substitute, Robert, what do you mean exactly? Substitute. When you said when you went from you didn't have when you when you added feature A basically, what, what was the process? So here you are predicting on here you are here you are doing baseline. Mm -hmm which I'm, I'm still not totally clear on the first, the first time I read this, I, I was under the impression that it was actually the mean of your features in, in the domain. And that whenever you were not including a prediction, you would use its mean. And that makes some sense because it's very well defined as you continue to add more features. Um, the, the reason that I decided that that may not be what's going on here is when you look at some of the plots that the library is producing, if that were the true definition, you should expect there to always be feature values that uniformly map to zero. There should exist some value of the feature that maps to zero. So the baseline doesn't have all the features in it? You're saying the baseline is the it, it the model is using features, but it's not setting features. It's using a distribution over the data because it's trying to say what would I predict given that I've been trained on a certain data set, but you're asking me to predict something for a point and you're not telling me what feature A is, what feature B is, or what feature C is for that point. So all I can do is try to predict some average over the training set that I've seen. Okay. And then if, I, if you're telling me, well, okay, now we're gonna move down here to this corner now I do know what feature A is, but you're still not telling me what features B and C are. Okay. Now you can use those same data, the, the uh, training, training data for the B and C, but for A, you're just gonna use the value of the feature that you've been told. And How presumably your model will do better using that. This also assumes working with already trained model. Do you retrain in the process or you just have a fully trained model? <clears throat> My understanding is that you always fully train a model before trying to run a Shapley or a Shap, mm -hmm. Shap values. So in, in that respect, it's like, you know, some, 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 somewhat similar to uh, partial dependence. So you freeze, 
and then you average across the existing features and then change the you know the target feature and see you know how how it influences the, the outcome it's the, the 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 whole idea is similar maybe the uh, specific implementation is uh, is different yeah the the main objective of why we would choose shap values over the methods that were presented in the last couple sections is that you might want individualized results specific for a certain sample rather than aggregating over the entire data set. Maybe we should go back to that example. <laughs> yeah, I think we've been <laughs> kind of looking at that cube for a while. <laughs> So anyway, the, the blog post is very helpful if you want to look further in detail. I, I will say that the portion after the joys of approximation, this was more confusing and I did not find it as helpful as the part on top, but, but this, this description up here is uh, very, much, very much on point for explaining how the the Shapley game theory result applies to this method. So, of course, we're not going to be calculating those by hand in our notebooks. If we were, we'd have to know a little bit more about the details. There's a library here to do it for us. For us. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the SHAP library, let's see. This is it. <clears throat> this is actually a great post here too. Very helpful readme although it did not clear up the question that I wanted to know about exactly how baseline is defined, but very helpful as far as implementing it and describing the basic ideas, lots of cool visualizations, some of which we will go into in the Kaggle course, others of which we don't. This one's pretty cool here. You can show how for the MNIST problem, you can see which pixels tend to be most predictive of a certain number and which ones are not. So if you're looking for a two, you'll get, you're, you're really focusing on, on this bit here, the corner and the, this end right here. If you're trying to find a one, then it's not only helpful to know that there's a line down the middle, but it's also really helpful to, to not see anything in the other pixels around it. Mm -hmm. So, so this, just to clarify here, this is, the, this is the actual data vector coming in, the image coming in. And this is what the SHAP values look like as applied to this data set, which is not binary anymore. So you have kind of a different predictor. It's a softmax on the end. So you're gonna get a different predictor for zero, one, two, three, four, so here's an example where maybe you, you might be confusing a three with a two, but having that blue spot there, blue spot there tend to lower your predictions of it being a three. I like confusing for the four with a nine. That looks like a better example. It is actually this, this four here really zeroes in on the fact that yeah, it's, it's located this box here, but the fact that there's nothing on the top yeah. is where it really sees the value that helps it know that this is a four and not a nine, which mm. puts a blue box on the top accordingly. The zero is also helpful here, but the, the empty space in the middle is very predictive. <laughs> this so, I <can> understand. <laughs> so yeah, lots of uh, cool examples shown here. Uh, the link to it is, is on the Kaggle course. So this is a binary classification. So what we're gonna get out of this is 
two probabilities, but they're not really independent. You're just going to get a probability of, I think it's no and a probability of yes. Mm -hmm. Probability of having man of match, probability of not. Team is 70% likely to have a player winning the award. So a little bit of implementation details. You import the library shop. You create an explainer object, and there's a few different options for that explainer. Uh, I can't remember if they go into it down here. Yeah, a uh, tree explainer, a deep explainer, and a kernel explainer. And you might ask, well, why, why do you need different ones? Because the method, ex method itself, as described, doesn't really vary from one explainer to the next. However, efficient implementations uh, are very important for a problem like this, where you saw that the exact solution is actually exponential in the number of features. So every one of these uses some approximations and other techniques to make the code a lot more efficient. And they're designed specifically for tree-based models, deep learning models, and then this kernel explainer, which does work with all models, but it's slower because it can't be optimized. And they show us how to make this uh, force plot in NetJS and throw in some arguments here. The explainer dot expected value is actually your baseline value. And in this case, it's somewhere around here. It's always going to be right in the middle of the graph. And you have to send it a few different parameters. We'll go into that in the, the exercise. Cool. So I think we've spent a lot of time on that, just trying to understand some of the real basics. Uh, we'll move into the notebook here. So we're no longer looking at New York City taxi trips. Let's see if I can run. Now we're gonna look at hospital data and in particular readmissions. So as a hospital, you're collecting a bunch of information on your patients and you would like to be able to avoid having people come back not too long after they've left, which is called a readmission. Hospital wants your help identifying patients at risk of being readmitted. So they do indicate here that doctors rather than your model will make the final decision, but they hope that you can provide with them with some kind of helpful information. <laughs> No pressure. <laughs> well, that being said, we should have asked the doctors for some helpful information as well, because there is zero documentation on this data set. Many of the many of the data sets we show here in the exercises, you you have a link to a Kaggle competition or something where you can get metadata, but here there's nothing. Yep. Robert, sorry, some housekeeping. Do you mind uh, closing that right panel real quick and maybe zooming in just a little bit? Closing what? The right panel. Um, no, there's a, there's uh, or the other way. Yeah. Just close it. There's a like upper right corner. There's like a, oh close. yeah, there you go. And just control plus or command plus once or twice. Perfect. Thank you. Cool. So lots of features here. Some of them, now let's go down to, I think I ran an info. Yeah. Right here. We have a number of integer features at the top, maybe a bit more interpretable. Time in hospital, number of procedures, number of medications, number of diagnoses, some demographic factors here, some billing factors here, diagnostics, a whole bunch of drugs or medications or something here. And the target variable at the end is integer one or zero, whether or not they're readmitted. We have 25,000 patients. Uh, I think the only thing really super interesting about this was that some of these features are very imbalanced, like number emergency, number inpatient. Uh, the vast majority of these are zeros and there might be one or two observations. Like this one here, number emergency was still zero at 75%. Uh, we'll skip that. 
I think we described all that. Oh, those aren't executable. So we're going to be training a random forest on this hospital data. And we'll just look at the first few rows, just the first five rows. Time in hospital. Some of these are indicators that remember they did occasionally go all the way up to 64, but are mostly zeros. Bunch of Boolean variables and a readmitted. So first question was, what can you do in just one or two graphics? Can you create one or two graphics that illustrate the value that you can provide to the doctors? So thought about this a bit and question is, if you start showing them certain plots, it's probably not going to be very helpful to someone who's not uh, trained in data science and other methods. Uh, for their idea of what to show, I think it was the same permutation importance. By showing permutation importance, you can immediately get a very small visualization that gives an idea of which features are the most important. Here, we really get only one that's super important, number of inpatient, whatever that means. I'm guessing number of inpatient procedures, but it's not defined. Number emergency, number outpatient, but the vast majority of these features really are not significant or not important by permutation importance anyway. Uh, skipped an import. Maybe I pulled it in later and imported it below. Oh yeah, I just wanted to see an ROC curve for this. Uh, I'll skip it. I, I probably imported. I think if I just do it straight here, it'll work. This was instructive actually, because he didn't go into it so much in the notebook, but it's, it's helpful to note that this model is overfitting pretty badly. This is the performance on the training set, ROC curve, perfect. Goes all the way up to the upper left corner. And on the validation set, not so much. The comments, the uh, su suggested solution had had indicated that you might want to give an indication of performance, but they don't really go into it any further in the notebook. PDP not defined, I must have missed something up here. Eh, well, we'll skip this, I guess. So I, that was just going to show you that there was a positive relationship between, you know, let's just pull it in anyway. You can take it from the tutorial, maybe? That's a it's picture. It's actually right here. Oh, perfect. Um, let me just oh. pull this. Probably all the imports that are needed. Yeah, the idea was just to show that it is significant enough and it's increasing. 
you can run for some other features and you'll see that they don't really deviate too much from zero for any other feature, if I recall correctly. So I think this is the same thing for a different feature, time in hospital. These large windows have changed. I don't know, when I, when I ran this earlier, I didn't get uh, large black hmm. portions of the screen. I'm not sure why. This is time in hospital. Maybe a slight increase, but not much. Time in hospital doesn't matter at all. So if, if that is what your model concluded, the doctors will believe it, but it seems low. Now they want you to make another plot. So in this case, we're looking at time in hospital. And what you wanna do is look to see what the readmission rate is as a function of the amount of time spent in the hospital. And this was another thing that I thought was somewhat interesting is that it's not really for, for a feature that is determined not to be helpful. It, it does seem to have a trend. Mm -hmm. uh, then finally you get to the very last step is the only one in this exercise. I think that used chap at all. So let's see, what was this? So I just chose one row that showed a fair number of medications and a readmission. Wanted to see what that might look like. We're predicting here are the SHAP values and you can see that the two arrays are basically one is the negative of the other because you're looking at the no and yes predictions. So one of them is going to be positive really related and the other one is going to be negatively related. And the expected value. Now the, the payoff here is they ask you to define a patient risk factors method, which will create a plot. And then when you use the plot, you'll get a one of these SHAP plots showing which ones were the most important features for that patient. And you get number inpatient, number outpatient, and the text up there indicates that supposedly the doctors will uh, uh, agree with this and think that the model is useful in spite of the rather serious rock. Yeah, it's interesting. There's nothing on the negative side, right? Or very few, or maybe. Very few, well, if there are any, they're, they're very difficult to see. Keep in mind that the model is predicting pretty high fraction, mm -hmm. so. Oh, you can mouse over, I guess. Yeah. Interesting. Cool. Are there anything questions wise we should go into? Just a couple of thoughts. And one is that in traditional deterministic modeling, when we do a sensitivity analysis, the monotonicity of the output on the inputs is really important. And I wonder if in that plot that didn't make so much intuitive sense, if that lack of monotonicity, I know it's data, not deterministic, but the way that you had those big downs as the trends seemed to be going up, I wonder if that created some of the unimportance sort of, of when we thought we saw a trend, but it didn't register. And I also wonder if- Are we talking about this image right here? Yeah, mm-hmm. Okay. And I also wonder if that change from 0.42 to 0.54 maybe pales in, in con 
in comparison to the change as the variable that mattered changed. You know, the, the output, maybe that's not a big change in output, even though we see that trend. Like, is, is that a big spread from 0.42 to 0.54 compared to other variables? Point, point 0.42 is what the... the, uh, the oh, point 0.4, yeah. Okay. I was just wondering that y-axis, how would that compare to another variable's y-axis? Well, yeah, that was actually uh, one of the reasons I originally plotted this thing, forcing the y limb to zero one, where it all of a sudden mm -hmm. doesn't look like there's much of a relationship. Yeah. yeah that, thanks for reminding me of that. And when you, when you do that, you get to. But I take it nothing you read talked about monotonicity mattering. And I guess with data, you don't expect to see it anyway. Well, monotonicity, I think when I've seen sensitivity analyses and worked with them in the past, in many cases, you're just doing it of local gradient based methods, right? So there might be a certain slope at one place, but it doesn't have to be the same everywhere. But, but, but again, that, that experience mostly comes from models, not from looking at, at data and especially tree based models of data. Yeah, I wasn't thinking of that, but okay. Once you once you use tree methods, then the concept of local gradients becomes challenging. Yeah, I was thinking of Latin hypercube sampling and partial rank correlation coefficients, which is a totally different world. But you know, I could see doing that with a black box as well. And I was just, but but I haven't seen anything about that with machine learning. Hmm. I think they, they have a they have an example in the partial dependent plots section, right? When uh, if we assume all the dependencies uh, uh, on the variables are monotonic, then partial dependence works pretty well and gives a very uh, salient picture. But if there are you know uh, uh, different signs and non-monotonic uh, relationships then uh, it can get blurred, you know, because it averages across other variables. And then it appears like it doesn't matter, but in fact, you know, it has a big influence. Yeah, actually my favorite set of exercises from this course was the ones in the partial dependent plots, because they asked some really good questions, especially that one about how would you rig a data set where you'll get partial dependent plots that are flat, but high permutation importance. And you know, the idea of just having one variable that's uh, half the time it's causing large increases in your data while the other half the time it's causing decreases is, is kind of a classic example for that. So the next section shows some other plots that are available through the SHAP library. And I think summary plots are the most important one that they go into here. So, and I think let's just look at the figure itself and think about what's going on here. So what we've done is we've divided the, we're looking at each row corresponds to a feature all the way from goal scored down to red. And it appears that these features have been sorted somehow in relation to the spread of their SHAP values. And we also have a horizontal axis that is those SHAP values. So as the, the goal scored shows that you have some, some cases where, where you uh, have very low negative SHAP values, other cases with high ones. Uh, each, each one of these shows the spread. And then the key is the feature value itself. So you go from whatever, whatever feature you're looking at, it'll have either a low value or a high value. So if you think about 
how one might interpret a plot like this, and you look at that first line, goal scored, this is telling you that not only are the is goal scored important as far as having high shop values and having high impact on your model output, but it's also having a very consistent impact on your model output because it the colors, the, the separation of the colors tells you that because the blue points, you see them all off to the left. Whenever you have a low feature value, you have a negative shap value. And whenever you have a high feature value, you have a positive shap value. In some cases, you'll have significant spread of values, but there might be mixing of the colors amongst all those values. I don't see a great example of that here. Um, maybe, maybe attempts, there's some mixing, even though it looks like there's more red over here. But in such a case, then you would assume that there's some complicated interactions between features that would cause high values to correlate negatively with outcome on one end, whereas for others at other places in your feature space, low values will be associated with low outcomes. So there's a lot that you can glean from a visualization like this. You can kind of see which, which features are unimportant, are not used at all here, these, these ones at the bottom. And maybe a feature that is definitely separated, but has small impact such as goals in PSO. I actually have no idea what PSO stands for. Robert, and the dots are the uh, data points, the teams? Does each, each sample in your data set is one dot. Does it imply that for some teams, the goal scored is, uh, has a negative effect on the probability of uh, naming you know, the best player or whatever the target was. So the blue points on the goal scored, you know, the left part of the goal scored, how, how would you interpret that? So the, the color scale over here, <clears throat> over here is feature value. And because goal scored is such a, it's a discrete feature where there's probably only a very small number of values. I think the typically teams don't score more than a, two or three goals in a game at most, maybe the occasional outlier. But uh, these blue points are almost certainly, team did not score any goals during mm -hmm. that game. Yep. And the purple points are probably team scored one goal and red is probably two and above, would be my guess. Or individual, right? Excuse me? Wouldn't it be, it's the individual that scored, not the team right this is so this is the team this is not individual it's at a point is, is is a result of a team playing okay i thought this was the uh being voted the most valuable player thing it, it is but the uh, but the outcome we're trying to predict is whether your team has the most valuable player <laughs> ah yeah got it, got it. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I think if we were looking at just the players, which, which would be an interesting prediction exercise in its own, then the goal scored variable would certainly be far more imbalanced. Yeah, okay. Yep, and as David said, PSO is penalty shootout. Penalty shootout, okay. Which explains why those are probably pretty highly correlated with it explains why there's a decent separation here between blue and red. You better get that penalty, otherwise you won't be man of the match. <laughs> you either red or blue. <laughs> well, it could also be just goal, goals in PSO. No, I guess it's, that's only talking about the goals that your team is scoring, not the ones that you're, that you're preventing or allowing. Must be, yeah. Hmm. 
All right, so summary plots in code. Now they're gonna just show us the code for doing this. This cell here has nothing to do. We're just fitting another random force classifier. Shap values for all the validation data with the following code. Again, we use the tree explainer object. It's the one that's most optimized for random forests. We pull the shap values. We calculate them on the validation set. And we make a summary plot for the validation set. Kind of similar looking, not surprising. Let's see, they do mention a few caveats here. They're calling shap values one because shap values is actually, uh, it's a little bit weird, but it outputs a list, a list in this case of two elements, but a lit, you're gonna get one element in the list for every possible outcome for your classifier. So for a binary classifier, you're kind of getting redundant outputs as we saw earlier. One is just the, the uh, minus one times the other. But for a multi-class classifier, you'll need all that information. And shap values can be very slow. Certainly we saw that if you are to calculate them exactly, you're going to be exponentially, you're gonna be running an extremely slow calculation uh, there are a lot of op the optimizations in the Shap library do allow you to make some approximations. Um, apparently, there's one for XGBoost, which is much faster. Probably because it can use some kind of gradient based method, I would guess. And so those are useful for looking at one feature, but sometimes you might want to look at more than one feature at a time. And here's a way to do that. And this is with the dependence contribution plot. And again, it takes a little bit of looking at the figure to understand what we're looking at. We're looking at one feature, the value of that feature going across the horizontal axis, the SHAP value for that feature plotted for each sample and then we're looking at a color coded by the value of another feature. So it can be interesting to see, does the pattern change as you look at different colors? And I think this is actually better illustrated in the exercise than here. So why don't we just jump right over to there? I've got it open already. This is the uh, hospital readmission data set, right? So we're looking at the hospital readmission data set again. This time they're doing things, a, uh, there's a couple things they're doing differently. Uh, we're looking at base features. So I think we're gonna be looking at just a subset of the features. Mm -hmm. And we're also going to reduce the size of the validation <clears throat> validation set significantly. Mm -hmm. We're just subsetting it as well because the SHAP calculation can be expensive. So <clears throat> I, I noticed they, uh, they restricted it to just uh, numeric values, right? There's one thing they did. And that's, that's necessary, correct? Uh, yes. I think- But, but actually they're different. using some of the Boolean features and they've just recast everything to float. As float zeros on one, right, okay. But you couldn't, but it'd be difficult unless you decide some kind of encoding to use categorical, most categorical features. Right, in this case, we only have integers and Booleans Right. So it's kind of trivial to, to do the okay. conversion. Okay. So it's really just a subset of the data set we looked at in the last one. Here we have the explainer. 
object and we're going to do a summary plot on our hospital data now. And remember number inpatient was the one feature that appeared to have the most impact earlier. And not only that, but it did have some uh, monotonic behavior. And we can see that right here in the summary plot where the low values of the feature coded in blue are on one side and the high values of the feature coded in red are on the other side. Whereas for some other features, we have things mixed together and it's a lot more complicated. Uh, especially if you look at num lab procedures, time in hospital. Again, you see that they've been sorted somehow to make the features with the most spread appear to be highest up. And that's actually one of the questions they ask at first is which of the following features has the most impact on predictions. And you're, you're looking at the Diag 1428 versus payer code here. And actually, the, the, there's a bigger range of effects on predictions. So really, they're just asking you to say that this one is a little bit wider from left to right than that one, even though there's some different structure here. And then, you know, do you think that the range is a good indication of which feature will have a higher permutation importance? And well, if you look at it, it, it probably doesn't because you think about permutation importance, this one may have a higher range of effects, but permutation importance is just going to swap these values and if we have a whole bunch of values, so like the blue ones are low and the red ones are high and there's only two values. So what we can see here just from this without even looking at the imbalance in the data set, but there's some indication here that there's probably a lot of blue points right here. There's only a handful of other points outside here and that's where the red ones are. So. If it's highly imbalanced, you're not going to get super high permutation importance, no matter what the spread of your data are, just because the imbalanced data set is most swaps done in the permutation importance will just be swapping this one variable for the same value again. In the case of payer code, things are quite a bit more complicated. It looks like there's a lot more mixing going on here and maybe the classes are more balanced. So that one might show a higher permutation importance. Let's see what they're asking here. So we're looking at the same figure again, and we're being asked, which do you think would have a bigger impact on predicted risk? And here, the separation in the classes is really what's important. The diagnostic may not show much permutation importance, but because the red separates itself pretty well from the blue, we know that if we change that feature value from low to high, it's likely to change the SHAP value quite a bit. Whereas for pair code, we've got blues and reds all mixed together here and it's not clear what would happen if we change it. So it's likely that the Diag 1428 is probably a higher, um, higher uh, impact on predicted readmission. So question four here, what do you think you might learn from the fact that num lab procedures has all these blue and pink dots jumbled together and num lab procedures is this one and i think what it tells you and i believe this text block down here is what i wrote while i was trying to reason the answer out myself and but the idea was just that these things are so mixed together that 
you would expect the uh, it just has a lot of complicated interactions. And the way I was thinking of that again was thinking about that from this same cubic perspective here when you have the blue and red dots all mixed together on these figures it's as though you're getting increasing slope here maybe decreasing slope at different ones whereas if they're separated pretty well you're likely to have the same gradient every time you go in the same direction notebook are we in here so question five here comes back to that contribution dependence plot and now we see a figure with some interesting structure in the color dependence as well as the spatial so we have we're given just some very generic this has nothing to do with the hospital data set anymore and they're asking us Consider the following plot. Do we think there's an interaction between the feature of interest and other feature? And anytime you see separation in the colors in a plot like this, there will definitely be an interaction. If there were no, if there were not an interaction between the features, you would expect no difference in the behavior of the blue points versus the red points. But in this case, you do have pretty strong interaction. I think the very final exercise here was just asking you to create uh, dependence plots. Not sure I executed all the cells again, but I think. And you were in another tab because this one is just starting. Uh, interesting. Who was on before it? Oh, I think I was in that one. There you go. Thank you. So we see something that's somewhat consistent with our intuition here. The num lab procedures was all mixed together. And you really see no difference in the behavior of points depending on color. The num medications was a rather complicated function up here, but it did look like there was some structure in here. And mm -hmm. so depending on how it interacts with other features, you might get difference in behavior from one number of medications to another. What's interesting here is there's a fourth parameter to this dependence plot called interaction index. So you can actually choose which other feature you interact with. When you choose auto, it just chooses one that it thinks is interesting somehow. Mm -hmm. It chose gender female on the first one and medical specialty on the other one. And I believe that is the end of this course. In the visualization that you showed with the interesting uh, dependencies, that looked to me like a three-dimensional visualization. Yeah, this one, plotted on, on two dimensions. Is that, is that uh, the, the message you got as well, or am I looking at this? Uh, I, I don't think that there is a three-dimensional data set behind this. I think it's just a coincidence that this appears. Oh, I just think he's saying the other feature could have been viewed as, as a z-axis, but instead they colored it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm saying oh, oh, that a z-axis, maybe the separation would be easier to see. I don't know. Uh, so it reminds uh, me. I can, I can say I have always struggled with 3D visualizations on 2D surfaces, and I say that after having uh, displayed a cube at you for quite a quite a portion of the evening. <laughs> I would just say I spent a lot of time in my life, my academic life, studying sensitivity analysis in a different setting, but I would just say that 
one of the things that I discovered is that if you take a variable that you decided wasn't important, so one of the ones that were down low on the scatter plot map, mm -hmm. and you take a couple of those and you throw them away, sometimes it can totally change the results with the other ones. Or if you change the range of one of the parameters that you, we, I did biological, computational biology. And so you would really think, okay, well, what's the biologically reasonable range of parameters to consider here? Because if you, if you did it with anything else, if you just said, well, I'm gonna look at half this or more, you know, then that changes the results of everything. It doesn't just change the results for that parameter. So this, this stuff can really be voodoo. And I just wanted to, to say that, that I think you would see that if you played with, these, with, with different ranges and different numbers of parameters, you could almost prove anything. You know, like you say, you can prove anything with statistics. So in your example, did you consider a smaller subset of range or did you consider like a, a shifted version of your ranges, Elsa? Um, yeah, when I, when I used to do this, I would, you know, really was trying to understand biologically what was most important, what was driving a model. And I found that it could be pretty frustrating because if you, if you decide, if you put, if you decide certain parameters weren't ranking as important and you take them out, you get different results and then you don't really know, well, what's, what's the right answer? What's fair? What's honest? Mm -hmm. When are you gaming something to, to make a point for publication or, you know? Yeah, one of the things that really struck me going through this series of exercises was thinking about every method that was shown, it wasn't too difficult to think of a data set where that could give you wildly misleading results. Yeah. After every one of these methods. Exactly. Maybe. It really, it's, it has to be used <laughs> with some ethics and conscience and I don't know. But I will take your suggestion, Robert, that I think we need another session on shaft values. Uh, I, I got the gist of it. I didn't get the full uh, full enjoyment of full detailed explanation or, or understanding I got from the, the shuffling, the, the feature importance and the permutations. Well, yeah, I, uh, you know, just, just started uh, looking at it and looked on the GitHub link and saw the, the library and its documentation and then you start reading the papers behind it and next thing i realized is there's way more to this than uh, than i'm going to understand here for, for this meetup awesome yeah um but as long as it's something practical you know like hopefully something practical we can take away i think to me that's more important than understanding all the details of how it works under the hood Cool. Uh, any more questions for Robert? Thank you, Robert. This was a very detailed analysis and thank you for sharing with us the cube and the paper and the blog and, <laughs> and the cool uh, 3D plots with different colors. <laughs> David, have you used any, uh, any of these approaches in uh, your work? I'm curious. Yeah, the, uh, the feature reports things are really, really common things to use with uh, tree-based models. To look at why um, I have I haven't done as much with SHAP. I've moved on to like causal type of analysis, so mm -hmm. slightly different stuff. Okay, maybe later we can visit causal if you if you recommend some good resources. That's a big topic. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure it is. Cool, friends. This was fun. Uh, thank you for sticking with us. And um, we'll be posting the recording sometime tomorrow, and you can see it on our on our playlist. It looks uh, like I've I've totally missed the entire chat box here, but it looks like there's a lot in there. Can that be copied and shared over to Slack? Yep, yep. I'll share it on Slack. Absolutely. I'll do that. Awesome. Yeah. Join us next time. Um, we are covering introduction to natural language processing. So um, for you who are, for, for all of you who are new to NLP, there'll be a great session for us who have taken the test flow and practice specialization. Um, maybe it's a little bit basic, but should be a fun, interesting uh, session. So hopefully you can join us next week. And we have a couple of more. We're almost uh, done with these Kaggle courses. They're getting a little bit more challenging in the end, but 
Uh, I think we're almost out of it. <laughs> cool. Thank you all so much for your time, your work. I really appreciate it. Yep, yep. It takes it takes a community, it takes a team to build this. So yeah, thanks you, Robert, again. Thank you, David, and thanks, Dimitri, and everyone who contributed. Yeah, great presentations. Great, great session. All right, friends, I'll stop the recording and I'll open the floor for free conversation if you want. But uh, if you're joining us online, see you next time.